evening so I'm that we are now recording. The talk today is a joint event for Ramat Aviv and Five Towns. I have worked again closely with my friend Terry Shlomo, who's from Ramat Aviv. So the title of today's talk is Passions of a Dancer. And it's a coming of age talk, which was about former principal ballerina Stephanie Herman's life struggles of making her dreams come true from injuries and then to performing worldwide. Her five foot nine height was too tall for most ballet companies, but through determination and passion, she made her dream come true. She danced with legendaries such as Rudolf Nureyev and Mikhail Baryshnikov worldwide. Her talk will include stories from her upcoming memoir and a Pilates ballet wellness program. The aging process has not deterred Stephanie from following her dreams and reinventing herself. At the age of 67, she produced and filmed Ballerina, a one woman play that won eight film festival awards. After several injuries that doctors could not heal, she actually healed herself and vowed to help others through her Pilates ballet wellness program, which I'm sure we'll hear more about very soon. And now, I just want to tell you that, would you please put your questions on chat and please keep muted throughout the talk. There will be a question and answer session at the end. And now, at last, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Stephanie Herman. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on my story of my passions as a dancer. I will be sharing a PowerPoint presentation with you. And at the end, I will be looking into your homes and you'll be looking into my home as we do a question and answer. So let's start and come into my passions of a dancer. Hold on. Okay, passions of a dancer, my life story. How did I get the passion to be a dancer? I don't know. Maybe when I was young, it started with, um, hold on a second. I am just trying, it's okay. It started as I was a young girl. I just liked to dance. I don't know what it was but it was just who I was. I think my passions also started because my mother was a concert pianist. She would perform all over the world and win awards and competitions. And then when she got married and had four children, she played the piano, the baby grand as a hobby. And it just, her, her soul spoke to me. And I just felt like dancing like Isadora Duncan. Little did I know that in junior high school 44, while I was doing my crunches in a sea of adolescent sweat, Mrs. Roberts, our gym teacher, came up to me while I was doing the crunches and asked, would you like to join our little ballet group in our after school program? in ballet before. And she said, well, it doesn't matter. You have the perfect body. So not knowing what I was getting into, I joined at three o'clock and I saw Erica. I was mesmerized by her. She was going to do this pirouette and she twirled around. And I just went up to her and I said, where did you learn how to do that? She said, School of American Ballet. I ran home and I told my mom, I got to go to school American ballet. So my mom researched that I needed to audition. So she took me to the audition and little did I know that school American ballet was George Balanchine's school from his New York City ballet. It was the best ballet school in the world. 
I was very naive and just excited to do whatever they told me to do. I was walking into this magical world of different leotards and tights and dancers drinking from the water fountain and stretching. And it was, it was just so magical for me. I was accepted and for the next couple of years, my life was facing the mirror. And School of Rackham Ballet was demanding 250% of perfection from me all the time and all the other dancers. My mom was also expecting perfection from me. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit of my story during that time. She has the perfect body type. Belle and Cheney loves the pinhead. Look at those long legs. She's musical. Did you see her turnout? She has rhythm. Did you see those arches? She's too tall for a career in ballet. Better to marry a rich man. What about fashion design? Face it, kid. You don't stand a chance. My advice? Cut your losses. You just don't have what it takes. It's obvious. What makes you think you can make it? Didn't think so. Not good enough, Stephanie. Try harder. My dream was to become a ballerina more than anything and working 250% was my passion because that was my dream. That's what I wanted to be. When it came time to audition for high school, I heard about uh, the famous school, High School Performing Arts. In order to audition, I had to put a dance together. So I asked my mom to record one of her Chopin pieces and I choreographed a dance. When I went to the audition and they put the tape recorder on and I started dancing, I felt like I was in the living room with my mom's piano and my mom playing as I performed my audition dance. I was accepted. It was a new life for me because high school performing arts was this magical place. You had dancers, you had musicians, you had actors, you had singers. And this was a school that graduates were became famous. I, I love the school because it wasn't as strict as the School of American Ballet. They, wasn't, they weren't demanding 250% of perfection. They were asking for our souls to come alive. And I think School of American, um, school of American Ballet was the pressure, but high school performing arts was the balance. And after a couple of years, I graduated and I won the Silva Award and I won a scholarship and my quest to become a ballerina was now a reality. I stopped growing at five foot nine, which was six feet on my tippy toes. 
and now it was time to audition. Well, five foot nine, six feet on point, audition after audition, rejection after rejection. Why? Because I was too tall for the corps de ballet. When you start in a ballet company, they start you in the corps de ballet and they don't want this big tall person to be sticking out. So I decided to go to college for a year and still take ballet classes. But for me, my goal and my dreams were still in my gut and my passion, I wanted to become a ballerina. One day in ballet class, Patricia Neary, who was the principal dancer with New York City Ballet, came and took my class and she came over to me, maybe because she was a tall dancer and I was tall. And she said she was guest teaching, uh, actually guest performing with Le Grand Théâtre de Genève, which was in Switzerland. And she said, would you like to be part of that company? I said, sure, why not? Well, I got accepted into the Ballet de Grand Théâtre de Genève in Switzerland. At the age of 19, there I was performing at this gorgeous, gorgeous theater. I was enveloped in history all around me. I was learning French. I was working and dancing with an orchestra. My life was becoming great. The director put another American dancer and I in this home for German girls till we found our own place. And in this home for German girls, they would feed us all of the yummy foods from the Swiss cows. Fondue, chocolate, yogurts, cheeses, and all the Swiss meats. And little did I know that I was gaining weight. The director, Alfonso Cata, put me on a scale and said, you have gained 15 pounds. You need to lose that weight. I, I never had a weight problem. And I, I, was, I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? So I had the passion that I needed to lose this weight. And so within a month, I lost the 15 pounds and I became a soloist. I was now reaching for the stars. My dreams were coming true. I started to dance solos. I was living my dream. We were performing throughout Europe. I was seeing Europe. I was dancing all these great roles. I was working with George Balanchine on some of his principal roles, Agon and Vugaku. I became famous for as a ballerina that was statuesque and flexible, but had emotion. And Agon was one of my famous roles, which I'd like to share with you.
Well, life was going on and our Grand Théâtre de Genève, there was the opera also. So the ballet company had to share the theater with the opera, which meant we didn't have that many performances. The tours were starting to get less. I was getting frustrated because I, I wanted to perform. I needed to perform. So I thought, well, maybe now that I've got these principal roles and I'm doing solos, maybe I should try my luck in New York. So I went to the director's office to quit, but Destiny played her role. He was not there. So then I was taken down to rehearsal and I was surprised to be the lead in Showboat, the ballet. I began questioning during this rehearsal if I should quit or not quit. And that was when I slipped on the floor and fell. My kneecap went totally off of my leg and I was looking at this kneecap and everybody else rushed over to me and they just stared at me and nobody knew what to do. I was in such huge pain. And I realized the only thing I needed to do was push my kneecap back into its place, which I did. And thankfully, it didn't hurt as much when I did it, but they had to lift me up and take me to the hospital. And at the hospital, they found out I had a torn cruciate ligament, torn ACL, and they put me in a three foot cast from my upper thigh to my ankle. And I decided time to go back home to New York. Well, I didn't have my independence anymore, living in Switzerland on my own. Now I was back home again with my mom and dad. Who was I if I wasn't a dancer? I was this injured soul. I knew I would dance again, but my mother kept saying to me, why don't you go back to college? I totally lost my identity. Luckily, my mom found a great physical therapist for me Carola Trier, who was actually a Pilates instructor. She was the first disciple of Joseph Pilates. She whipped me back into shape and I actually became stronger than I was before. And I decided, okay, I am gonna become a ballerina again. I'm gonna fight the odds. I don't care if I'm tall, I'm just going to audition and audition. And I heard that Finally, Patricia Neary took over the Ballet de Grand Théâtre de Genève in Switzerland, and she brought me back to Switzerland, and the company was performing more with her under her directorship, and George Balanchine was the artistic director, and life was moving on the way I wanted to. She then decided to move the company after three years in Geneva to Zurich. So now I was learning German. So French was in Geneva, German was in Zurich and life was great. I got to dance with Rudolf Nureyev. He came into our studio one day to cast the company for his ballet Manfred. I was at the ballet bar and I just felt his eyes upon me. And I felt as if our souls were connecting. It was unspeakable words. There was no words. It was just, there was a connection between us. Later that day, I found out that he cast me as his mother in Manfred, which is the story of Lord Byron. Working with Nerea was so fabulous. He just motivated me to be the best I could be without pushing me 250% of perfection he just inspired me that I could do anything. And on stage, our souls did connect. I actually have a funny story about Nureyev and I that I'd like to share with you. Sorry. One day in rehearsal, he came up to me and he goes, what size your boots, your boots? What size your boots? And I looked at him and I go, excuse me, what are you talking about? And he says, what size your boots, your shoes, your toe shoes? And I said, excuse me, are you calling my toe shoes boots? Yes, because they're big. 
I said, you say my feet are big? Well, you're tall, you're big. I want your shoes because I think I could wear them. So I went, well, okay. So I've got a great idea. <laughs> I said, how about if I give you my toe shoes and I'll autograph my toe shoes for you and you give me your ballet shoes and you autograph your ballet shoes for me. And he looks at me like, nobody's ever done this before to him. And he thinks for a moment. He goes, okay, you go to my dressing room, you get it later. So I go to his dressing room later with my toe shoes autographed and, and his masseuse is there and his masseuse says, oh my God, I know what you did. He never ever gives his shoes to anybody. And so here were these pair of shoes, each one was autographed and they were ripped apart because he loves to wear his shoes till there's nothing left in it. And now those shoes that she gave me, I gave on loan to the Young Museum and they're here at the Nerea Costume Exhibit and it's very exciting. My life was going on. My passions were being stimulated as a dancer. I was working with George Balanchine on Agon and Bugaku and he was coaching me. It was, it was a dream come true, it really was. But I decided that the, because the Zurich Ballet Theater, the company, the actual Zurich Theater was being renovated. And the tours that we went on were just around Switzerland and these small little theaters. We weren't being challenged anymore. I wasn't being challenged by different new roles. So I decided to leave again, try my luck again. <laughs> I guess I haven't learned. Anyway, I flew to New York. I auditioned with confidence now that I was a principal dancer, but again, too tall. I began to guest perform only be to become injured again. This time, it took three years to heal. Doctors didn't think I would ever be out of pain. They sent me to pain management clinics. I was losing my identity. I didn't have a job. I had to take on these very strange jobs. And I was in pain. I couldn't sit without pain. I. I, I just didn't know what my life was going to become. But I researched and researched all about kinesiology and the body and all alternative methods of healing. And I started analyzing, why am I in pain? What can I do to get out of my pain? I knew there had to be an answer. And after three years, I finally discovered it was something as small as a compensation pattern that was causing so much pain. I changed that compensation pattern and I, was, I, was, I had my dancer body back again. But this time I vowed to help others by helping them heal. I created my Pilates Ballet by Stephanie Herman wellness program. I got married, I adopted a beautiful daughter from China, we moved to California, I, my life was becoming enriched. But as my daughter grew older, and it was time for her to go to college, I started getting that bug. Again, I wanted to perform. I was 67 years young now. And what was I to do? And I figured, the only thing I could possibly do was to produce my own one woman show. And I decided to do that. But while I was doing that or before I was producing it, I developed the Stephanie Herman TV show from a local access TV channel. This was a show about living life by loving it. I would interview interesting people, artists, and I would have chefs I would bring people to glorious, beautiful places to show them how to live life to the fullest. And sometimes I would even perform or I would have other artists perform. But here I am trying to produce my one woman show and I only had three months to do it. I needed to get back into shape because I wasn't totally in ballet shape, but I did it. And the glorious thing about my ballerina one woman play was 
I was accepted again at the age of 67. I won awards for Ballerina One Woman Play and I was living my life still at the age of 67 and now I am 71 and nothing's stopping me. I still have the Stephanie Herman show and right now I've just finished writing my memoir and I am looking to publish it very soon and I'm also helping others through my Pilates Ballet Wellness Program to heal. And I feel enriched in my life. And if you want to watch Ballerina Woman, Woman Play, you can go to YouTube and just type in Ballerina One Woman Play. It's a 40 minute short and it is my life story like it is today. So on that note, I would like to have any questions and answers. Yeah. Cool. So is there anybody there out there in the great ether who would like to ask a wonderful opportunity to ask Stephanie about her life and some more details about it? Oh, yes, I've got uh, Gilgi or Jilgi. Would you un Would you unmute, please? If you want to ask a question, you must unmute so we can hear you. Gilgi, unmute, please. Yeah. Okay. Done. Thank you. Can we you can hear, hear you now. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. It was great. I would really be very interested in hearing more about your program for I helping know. others and healing. I'm really fascinated by that. Okay. And Thank you've you. had a great life. You've had a great life. <laughs> I look forward to, uh, I will share it with you right now. Can you all see me? Yeah. Um, thank you. Well, I think as a ballerina, you had to get into your body organically. And as a ballerina, you had to analyze, like if you were doing a balance, you'd have to analyze where your body might be off. So little did I know that even as a ballerina, I was learning how to analyze the body in ways that I think maybe doctors and physical therapists don't see, like I have this dancer's eye. And then during that whole time when I was injured, I started learning all about kinesiology and the body and bone rhythms. What I love to educate is bone rhythms, is how your bones rotate within each of its sockets when you're moving. And a lot of people don't comprehend how the bones move in movement. And I love educating people on just how your pelvis moves if you squat, how your femur rotates. And if you understand these movements, which are very simple to learn, you'll realize if you're just squatting down to pick up something, you actually have more flexibility because you're going with the anatomy opposed to going against the anatomy. And I find my specialty is really analyzing where people's compensation patterns are causing difficulties or pain. So sometimes I might look at somebody, I'll have them close their eyes and stand for a minute. The reason why I do that is in the very beginning when people are standing, they're trying to be perfect in the posture. And then after about a minute, they slump into what's comfortable. When I see them slumping into their comfort zone, I can see, oh my gosh, you know, their right foot is dropping or your, their right hip is lifting or they're rotating the pelvis or one shoulder's higher. And then I analyze, well, why is this happening? Sometimes I'll find out that they have one leg that's longer or that their spine is rotated or the pelvis is rotated. And that tells me what kind of program I need to design for them. 
And when I design the program for them, what I do is I start educating them brain to body how to find specific muscle isolations. So if you're sitting here and watching me right now, here's some of the things I'll have you do. I'll say, can you squeeze your glutes together? Just go squeeze, 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 like quickly, boom, boom, boom. And you might say, okay, yes, I can. Or you could say, no, I can't. Or I'll say, can you just squeeze the right one and just go boom, boom, boom. You go, oh my God, I can't. Or your left one, boom, boom, boom. Now, if you can't find contraction through your brain, that tells me that there's blockage. And I, that's my responsibility to help educate you on how to build that connection. It's electrical stimulation and it can, it can be built. It takes about six weeks, but if you just start sending that message, it's, it's almost like you're looking for contact lenses in the forest and you can't find it, but the contact lenses are there. And the more you do repetition of trying to contract that specific muscle isolation, you actually start building more muscle fibers and more muscle fibers you build helps you become stronger in that specific area that might have become atrophied because of the compensation patterns that you develop because of pain or trying to not feel the pain. Mm -hmm. um, so did that explain it? <laughs> yeah, that was, that was great. How are you in Israel? Are you or are you living in, in, in California? I'm still in California, but I do offer fitness assessment through Zoom. And I've been doing that through uh, the whole time on COVID. And I find that I can see a lot on Zoom. So be careful. <laughs> can we get your email, Stephanie? I would love that. It is. I'm wait, 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 wait. Stephanie, if you could put it on chat, then everybody can see it. Uh, okay, let's that see. Way. Let's write um, S. H one D A N C E R at A O L dot com. Okay, did I write it right? Yes, I did. It's S H one dancer. One dancer. Okay. At A O L, at A -O -L. dot com. Okay. Now, uh, my website, which is stephanieherman dot com. If you lose my email, you can always go to my website and join my mailing, my mailing list. And um, you could discover more about my program on my website too. Good, I've got another question for you from Caroline Igra. Yeah. And she would like to hear how you got into Pilates and what makes your version different from other kinds of Pilates? <laughs> well, as, um, as you heard when I was injured at the age of 23 and I met the first disciple of Joseph Pilates, which was Carola Trier, she started educating me all about Pilates. And throughout my whole career, in fact, even today, in a couple of hours, I'm taking my Pilates class, um, I've kept up my Pilates by different masters and I kept my education up. So I sort of feel like I am a chef <laughs> and I've been taught all different ways to cook and my way of doing Pilates might be a fusion of Pilates. It's a little Franklin, it's a little uh, kinesiology, it's physical therapy, it's movement, it's 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 a fusion of who I am and, and it's not going to be your typical Pilates so don't don't come to me if you expect to have the typical hundreds or the different exercises that you get in Pilates I call I call my program Pilates ballet because I am a master of Pilates and I was a master of ballet and I would be your educator and 
I look at you and I analyze you from what I see. I look at your whole body. I look at your life. Sometimes, you know, a physical ailment can come from something that you're stuck in in your life and not having courage to move on with. So I feel like I'm a life coach and a, and a, a Pilates fusion chef. Yeah, I, I have a question, Stephanie. I've never done ballet, although I love to dance. Can you just describe what it's like when you're learning to stand on point in those ballet shoes? Because it always looks so incredibly <laughs> painful. Uh, just describe what it's like to, uh, to learn to, to do that, to be able to do that. Well, you are taught to do that at a very, well, I was taught to do it at the age of 14, which was kind of older because I started ballet at the age of 12. Uh, But uh, luckily at the School of American Ballet, their education of the body was wonderful technique and it's lifting all of your weight up. Everything was lifting up. So when we started learning how to be on point, you're not heavy into those toes, but you're learning the muscles to lift you out. In the very beginning, yes, I got blisters. Even as I performed, sometimes I would get blisters. Um, I would take each toe and then I would put lamb's wool and then I would put my toe shoe on. On the Stephanie Herman show, if you go to YouTube, the Stephanie Herman show, I think I have a show on toe shoes and touring. And I talk all about the toe shoes and how to break them in and how to sew the ribbons on and uh, how to put shellac in the box when it gets soft. So um, yeah, check that out. But yes, in the beginning, it was really awful. And it was something that as a kid, everybody looked forward to. And um, it's exciting. But the more you do rehearsing on it and learning, it becomes easier. And then when you're performing, you, you don't feel like you're on point. It's just an extension of your foot. Unless you know, you have a blister and you have to perform, it's really awful. And sometimes with a blister, I had to put cushioning around the blister and then I had to even cut the toe shoe where the blister was. I became a a product designer of my toe shoes. Thank you very much, Ida. Yeah, I'd like to come to Marion Juster. Marion, unmute yourself. If you'd like to speak to Stephanie, please. Yes, Uh, I was very impressed with your story, Stephanie, first of all, and your will to succeed what you did. And I wanted to know if you still have a connection with performing arts. I'm a graduate of music and art, which was one of the predecessors, and I'm still in the Alumni Association and all that. And I visited it once at Lincoln Center, which was wonderful. So do you still keep up with that? Yes, I do. Um, on Facebook, and when we had our 45th reunion, I went back to New York, and that was very interesting to just see everybody. You know, some of the dancers are not dancing or haven't danced, and they chose a different career. Some gained weight. Uh, some actors kept on acting, Melissa Manchester kept singing, and we just stay in contact all the time. Whenever it's anybody's birthday, we celebrate their birthday on Facebook. It's my extended family, and it will always be my extended family. Very good. So the answer is yes. <laughs> right. I've got a few people still got some questions. Nahama, you'll come third. <laughs> I'm going to go to, uh, to first of all, talk a uh, question from Eileen Bloch Levy. Wants to know from you, Stephanie, uh, what life skills do you believe were your takeaway from your ballet career? What life skills did you get? That is a fabulous question. Um, when I was injured the second time and I knew I wasn't going back into ballet anymore, 
and I thought I might be injured with pain for the rest of my life. I needed to find a new career of some sort. And the life skills that ballet taught me were, here's one, when you're looking for something and you can't find it, you have to keep looking. Like in ballet, when you try to do a pirouette and it's not working, you just have to keep trying. And then if it's still not working, you have to ask yourself, why isn't it working? What am I doing wrong? And I think some of those skills help me to develop further in my different careers that I went on to doing. And um, I think tenacity is a huge skill. Um, being in pain and realizing that pain doesn't have to be for the rest of your life was huge. It's, I think that's part of who I am right now. You know, uh, like two days ago, my, my hip was hurting me so badly and it wasn't like, oh no, I'm gonna have to live the rest of my life in pain. Well, I went to my chiropractor and I put ice on it and I rested and now I'm back to normal again. And that was another wonderful skill. Um, rehearsing, you know, just keep going. So when I started writing my memoir, the very beginning when I started, I was stuck on the first paragraph for months because <laughs> I kept trying to perfect it. And um, I was smart enough to hire a writing coach to help me get past that paragraph. And then I had the discipline to just write every single day. And then I started enjoying it and I started loving it. And I feel I got great discipline. And it's not, it doesn't feel like a chore. I think ballet taught me discipline is a joy and, and it helps you go get past or, or go forward. I think those are some good ones. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Got a couple more questions and then I think we'll close. Judith Sternfeld, you look like you would like to ask a question. Would you unmute yourself first, please, Judith? That, is that okay? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can, we can hear you, Judith. Yeah, I know ballet is one of the most um, demanding, physically demanding um, dance forms. I was wondering if when you were injured, um, did you ever consider switching to another dance form that is not quite as demanding on the body as ballet, especially since it was a, a knee injury. So um, if you do watch Ballerina One Woman play, you'll see that I did study with Alvin Ailey. And um, when I didn't think I was gonna make it in the ballet world, I worked with Alvin Ailey in his repertoire workshop. And it was fabulous. And I it, it, it is fabulous. I've, you know, I've studied there too. Not on that level, but it's, it's I fabulous. also, you know, I took yeah. jazz classes. I took modern classes. Um, and now that I'm older, and I'm 71 years young, <laughs> I, I, I choreograph my own dances. So, um, if in my choreography, it'll be kind of jazzy, lyrical. Um, I won't get my leg up too high in the back because I can't, but I'll do a lot of emotional expressions with my arms. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I did study all different forms of dance and um, they are again, the fusion of who I am. And now are you performing in dance or? I did I have my TV show, The Stephanie Herman Show. I, uh, my next show that's coming out is about Wild Aid, a nonprofit organization that helps awareness and the protection of animals and sea creatures. And I was very lucky to have Theory Mallet, a famous movie composer, compose two minutes of music for my dance. And um, Azita Ganji and David Simon brought me to the beach 
and I choreographed this dance along the ocean and the rocks. <laughs> and it should be coming out in the next couple of months. So yes, I'm still dancing. <laughs> That's wonderful. Never stop. Never and stop. also, I'm a dancer too. And I always believe that even when the body is not able to dance as fully out as it did when we were younger, that the spirit always continues to dance. Dancers never stop dancing. No, and I hope not to, you know, for my hundredth birthday, I will be dancing and blowing out the candles. <laughs> and I hope watching. everybody keeps the spirit of dance within them. Well, we all have it. There you go. Mm -hmm. Thank Judy, you. thank you very much for your questions. I've got one last person who wants to ask you a question, Stephanie. I will go to Nechama Chesses. Nechama. Chesses, Chesses. <laughs> that's, okay. that's okay. I'm, I'm, I really enjoyed your presentation, Stephanie. Um, I, I admire you as, as keeping in the field and, and staying fit yourself and sharing your, you know, your love of dance with others. I'm a dance therapist. So, um, yeah, so mostly working with, um, uh, special needs community. Now I'm working with people with Parkinson's. You might be aware of the dance for Parkinson's for the um, Mark Morris company in, in Brooklyn. That's yeah. So I, I did a training with them and I used to study at the American Dance Festival in, in Connecticut where I'm from originally. So I, I was exposed to a lot of wonderful companies early on, but I'm, you know, I'm a religious Jewish, so I, I chose not to perform, but I have been I teach and I've shared my love of dance with uh, children and parents and um, and now as a therapist working with people with movement disorders. So I really, I truly admire, I think Pilates is wonderful. I haven't really delved in it so much myself. I'm, you know, also in my 60s, I'm in my 60s, a little bit younger than you, but not much. And um, I'm finding that it's really hard for me to see my body change and not feel as energetic and go to a class with much younger, you know, there's not a lot of choices. We live in the North of Israel. So it's not like being in Tel Aviv, you know, where there's more dance uh, available. But um, you know, I have to I have to monitor myself and make sure that I don't get over over tired, but still enjoy taking classes and um, and you know teaching. I teach on Zoom, but it's very hard during COVID to you know to teach in, uh, frontally in a class. But I um, I guess I was just curious to see. I mean, um, you didn't really talk much about your Jewish side, um, and I was just wondering, like in the early days with Balanchine and and. Uh, Nuriev, and these are some of our, you know, people that I've always admired. Like, was that ever an issue uh, in the early days of your training? I mean, you know, where you feel like you were stigmatized because you were tall. It wasn't anything to do with your your background. I mean, you were. You, do you feel like you were treated e equally for all along? Um, I, you know, I, I never, you know, I think I'm a person who loves people. And I feel like I'm open to looking at people for who they are and seeing the good of people. And I think that took me through life without stigmas of, you know, being Jewish. I mean, yes, being tall was hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I, I, I never felt it was against me when I started at the Geneva Ballet Company, we had people from Romania, from Russia, from Holland, from Paris, from Italy, and we were all sorts pulled together. And it was, we were people, we were dancers. We weren't, oh, anything was against us. There were, we had black people, white, short, tall, whatever. Um, so no, but I wanted to talk about the Parkinson's because I started uh, working with Parkinson's patients a long time ago before Mark Morris. And I found huge success in the way I worked with them. Usually I like to get a Parkinson's patient in the very beginning when they just find out that they've got it. And what I do with them is I stimulate, I keep the stimulation of the dopamines of that mind to body. And if they can start to find these muscle isolation contractions early on, 
I've noticed it actually slows down the progression of the disease. Yeah. And um, if you, you know, if you ever, I also do teacher trainings and different programs. So if anybody wants to learn more about my methods, again, you can go to stephanieherman.com or email me and I'd be more than happy to share with you some of my education that I've yeah. learned and created. When, did you ever meet Judith Jamison when you were at Ailey? No, I didn't. I uh, know. She's I another know. tall dance, another tall dancer you could relate to. <laughs> I totally did. And and her cry was amazing. Wow. And she is yeah. taller than me. So um, <laughs> but you know, she had she had Alvin Ailey choreograph for her. So that was sure, really of course. Cool. Every time I see revelations, I just get you know, that same excitement from the first time I saw it in New York and I see it on recordings now and I still get that same thrill, you know, it's beautiful. Well, yeah. good luck to you, okay? Thank and you, thank you so much for sharing. And, and can I make one more suggestion to you? When you take dance class, don't look at everybody else. Don't compare yourself <laughs> with who you were. Be in the moment, be who yeah. you are. And if you don't feel energy, go with it because it will take you into energy. Right. Here at the moment. Right. I thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Good luck to you too. Thank you. Hama, thank you for your question. And Stephanie, I think that brings us to the end of this session. Oh. I see Terry Schlummer with her hand up. Do you want to ask a question, Terry? No, I just want to say thank you, Stephanie. As a former performing arts dance graduate, you're an inspiration to me at my age, and I've continued exercising and dancing and so forth. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, it was a joy. Thank you all. Terry, thanks for that. And just before we conclude, I'm going to ask my friend Lucille Cohen to say a few words of thanks. Lucille. Well, Stephanie, what can we say to that? You're an absolute inspiration to us all. It seems that your passion has really carried you through life to the extent that you've managed to show tenacity in the face of adversity and injury. Your perseverance has carried you through and you've applied it to the rest of your life. I think we can learn a lot of lessons from you. And to see you looking so glamorous and so much in charge of your life, you know, you, you really effect your own life you've made it effected into into what you want it to be and you're a true inspiration and thank you so much for sharing all that with us and i'm sure there's a lot more to see and hear that we could enjoy too so i'm sure we'll be logging on to your website thank you again stephanie thank you very much thank you that was beautifully put and i hope that this is an inspiration for everyone to buy my memoir when it comes out <laughs> um, well, well. Come to Israel, Stephanie. Come, I come. Love. Invite come. me. Stephanie, Give us classes. Stops, okay? Stephanie, I will invite you and I will try when COVID is settled and so forth to maybe produce your one woman show here. Oh, that would be wonderful. Right. I would love right. to be able to do that. And I think I might be able to try center, center stage. Yes, yes. Try center no, stage. I, it's, I, can do, I, I can do it at Habima. I can do it at the National okay. Theatre. I have a good connection there. Well, let's do it before and if I mean. that doesn't work, Center Stage is uh, the only uh, English, professional English theatre in Israel with professional actors. It's a small space, it's an intimate space, but I could see it working very well there, actually. It was an inspiration. Thank you. Good. Well, look, thank you very, very much for everyone to attend this talk tonight. Much appreciated. And Stephanie, finally, thank you once again from the bottom of our hearts, from all of us here from around the world. Good night to you all. Good night. Mm -hmm.